Talk about F-35. Um, somebody uh, said it, it's like a Swiss army knife. It's got all these things on it and nothing really, really properly works. Um, it's probably too much of a compliment to call it a Swiss army knife because even once you get the blade out on a Swiss army knife, you can do something useful with it. Um, I don't see the F-35 that way at all. I see it as a dog in all of its roles. Um, it has three primary roles. As a fighter, it's too heavy and sluggish to be successful as a fighter in aerodynamic terms. It relies on this um, hypothetical technology that's always failed in real air combat, the beyond visual range, radar-based missile technology. It's all very fancy, but it's not performed well in past air combat and it's much over height in terms of being the way to shoot down enemy airplanes. As a uh, bomber, it's a bomb truck just like the F-16. It's got some new fancy uh, software and sensors, uh, but it's still going to be bombing uh, geographic coordinates from 10 or 20,000 feet, just like an F-16. And if you were hot to do that, you can easily put that a new technology in an F-16. It won't get you very much, but um, you can do it if you want. As a close air support uh, aircraft, which the F-35 is also supposed to be, it's a complete disaster. It can't perform the mission. It is too delicate. It doesn't have the loiter capability to stick around on a battlefield for hour after hour to help our troops out. Um, it's too thin-skinned. If it does come down low to try to find targets, it can't fly slow enough to discriminate them. And even in the presence, if, if it does slow down as much as it can, it's vulnerable to the kinds of weapons that can shoot it down. Small arms, machine guns, um, uh, even assault rifles. As the F-35 continues to grow in cost and continues to show in testing, if they ever get it carried out, um, that it's not going to even uh, achieve the modest performance requirements of it, um, the Navy is very likely or very possibly might back out of the airplane as it did before. Um, uh, that's a, um, um, a bureaucratic fight that's being um, engaged in below the horizon in the Pentagon today. Um, our Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, is very much in charge and the Navy is very reluctant to challenge him on the F-35. Um, and Gates has been working pretty hard to suppress any anti-F-35 movement in the Navy, but it's there. And when the time comes for the Navy to start paying big bucks to buy its F-35 contingent, when that time comes in a year or two, um, it's very possible the Navy might begin to back out. Um, they might say, uh, we simply can't afford it. They might say, we'll just buy a few and we'll buy more F-18s instead. Uh, but there's something going on there and um, uh, time, will, time will tell whether this resistance in the Navy to the F-35 actually surfaces. This airplane uh, started in the um, late 80s, early 90s as, some, as a dream of some technologists in the Pentagon. When they first trotted out what they wanted to do, it was obvious from the very start that we would, we would have all of these problems. Um, the cost growth, the performance problems, the schedule delays, it was all built into the design of the airplane and the way the Pentagon put together the program. They did the following stupid things. Um, they trotted out a price for the design that was the laughing stock of informed observers, but that remained the official price goal for the airplane. $35 million per airplane. 
it's um, now about five times that cost. They trotted out a schedule for their plane where it would, the test program and, and the uh, airplane would, be, would have been deployed a year or two ago. Instead, they have a pathetic test plan that will only explore 17% of the performance characteristics of the airplane when they declare the test program done. Um, they're about four years late from their original projections about when uh, prototype copies of this airplane would be available to our armed forces. This is the inevitable result of two layers of complexity. They made the individual airplane itself um, extremely complex by making it a multi-role airplane, something that tries to do all things. Uh, all that means is that you are engaging in lots of trade-offs on the performance of the airplane for each of these missions, such that you're uh, reducing the performance on one dimension so you're able to do it on the other at all. Um, and it's full of design compromises. It's full of complexity uh, um, to perform um, the uh, missions for three services. It's not just that the, um, the Air Force version of the airplane is highly complex and multi-role and compromised. But when you also design an airplane to accommodate both the Marines and the Navy, you're engaging in a whole second layer of trade-offs. In order to accommodate the Marines' desire for short takeoff and vertical landing, the Stovall capability, you've built things into the Air Force and Navy version of the airplane that you wouldn't have otherwise in terms of the structure of the airplane and, and so on. Um, same thing with the Navy version. The Navy wanted a bigger wing and beefier landing gear to be able to land on carriers. That also causes compromises um, um, in the program. Um, one of the selling points of this thing was that, well, we're going to have one version for three services. Baloney. It's not one airplane for three services. Only 30% of this airplane has common parts and components. Um, it's three different airplanes with one-third of their parts being common. One of, the, one of the more subtle consequences of this airplane is that it's so expensive to buy and it's going to be so expensive to maintain because, it, because, it's, because of its complexity. It will uh, force air forces to look for ways to pay to be able to maintain it after they've paid to buy it. And one of the places they will raid money is training. We've already done that in this country. Today, an F-22 pilot gets the pathetic amount of 10 to 12 hours in the air for air combat maneuvering actually in the airplane. That is about one-third of what it should be. It's, a, it's less than half of what it was at the end of the Vietnam War, for example. And we have done that because the airplane is so expensive to maintain and keep in the air that the Air Force is raiding other accounts to, um, to pay for that. And it's um, reassuring itself it can do that because, well, we, we don't have to fly our pilots in the air. We can fly them in simulators. Um, simulators have their uses, but uh, giving somebody the precise uh, physical and mental tools they need to, sur to survive in air war, a simulator does not cut it. Uh, they need time in the air um, exercising um, against dissimilar airplanes piloted by competent, well-trained pilots to refine their skills. And simulators don't do that. How long before the F-16s actually fall out of the sky? It's not a question of time. It's a question of hours in the air. 
airplane age is measured by air hours. Our B-52s have been flying since the early 1960s and their structural life will, will remain viable for another 30 years. Um, the F-16s have less hours built into their airframe and as fighters they stress themselves more than bombers do. Um, but it's a exercise that any competent manufacturer can go through to what they to do what they call zero time the airframe. Uh, you can return the airframe to zero zero hours in the air. Uh, it takes a lot of work. It's, it's fairly expensive. Um, but you can do that. Or it's not as expensive as buying a new F thirty four. Oh, it's a, it's one 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 hundredth that cost. Or you don't need to zero time the airframe. You can do certain things to strengthen, inspect the airplane, find where there are structural issues or corrosion, um, and fix those things on an ad hoc basis. That's not cheap either, um, um, but it, um, it's very doable. And again, it could you know, keep F-16s in the air for a couple thousand more hours, giving everybody time to sort out a good airplane. What we should do in this country is stop production of this dog, take, that, take a small part of that money and hold a fly-off competition of combat-ready prototypes. We could do that in, in a year or two uh, for the F-16, um, for the YF-16, YF-17 fly-off in the late 1960s. It took a couple, three years to do that. We could do that now if we, if we were serious about giving ourselves really first-rate quality airplanes. Uh, and by the way, these airplanes would not be a multi-role design. They would be single-role designs for fighters and close-air support airplanes and bombers if you want them. Um, that would uh, uh, on, not only give you better airplanes, it would give you cheaper airplanes. Um, um, and the, I can almost guarantee you, if you did it right, um, the total cost would be far less than F-35. The, the key to that statement, though, was if you do it right. We have to learn how to do it right in this country. We've forgotten how to do that. If the Dutch Prime Minister would call you in a couple of weeks' time, he says, Mr. Wheeler, you got to help me. What should I do? Run. Get away from that airplane. It's going to ruin your air force. You've already uh, your your his own plan will shrink the size of your air force, and it'll give you an airplane that is so hard to maintain that your pilots would not be able to fly in it often enough to train properly because it won't be affordable, and it'll give you an airplane that uh, is no better a bomb truck than the F-16. Uh, can't perform the close air support mission, just like the F-16 cannot perform the close air support mission. Um, and um, you have F-16As in your Air Force, the early version. Um, that's a fairly hot airplane. Your pilots, when they, get, when they trans, transfer to F-35s, uh, they're going to expect a hot, you know, a, agile airplane. They're going to be horrified. They're going to find that that airplane is no better in terms of aerodynamic agility than the F-16s they have right now. Run, you say? Run. Get away Don't from walk, it. run. <laughs>